ah, but enough about football. Let's kind of change tax a little bit. So another great thing or interesting thing that I read or listened to or watched this week was um, Dan Bowles, Dan Bilzerian, is it how you pronounce it? Dan Bilzerian or Dan Bowlesarian? Dan Bill? Is it Dan Bill or Dan Bow? Whatever it is. Dan Bilzerian, who I'm sure a lot of you would know from Instagram, he kind of wrote a comments about three to four years ago and he's this guy in his 30s who's insanely rich and goes around like posting pictures of himself with scantily clad women in amazing cars toting himself with guns and doing just crazy baller shit so he doesn't really do that many interviews i've i've heard or from joe rogan basically and from doing a quick a couple of google so it was a bit weird to kind of see him pop up on the on my joe rogan feed so he appeared on joe rogan's podcast the other day and what made it more funny was that I remember a few episodes ago, I think it might have been during a fight companion, Joe Rogan, Brian Callen and kind of Brendan Shaw got into a bit of a debate about the merits of um, Dan Brazarian's life and whether or not he's fulfilled and loads of sort of like pseudo intellectual shit. And it was funny because they were, uh, they, I say probably specifically Brian Callen made a lot of assumptions about Dan Brazarian's character due to what he posted on social media, which is, you know, which is neither here or there. I guess a lot of us do that sort of thing because that's the only touch point of information that we have about a person is what they put out on their social. So I guess if he's doing stuff that people would interpret to be a bit douchey, then I guess, you know, whatever, think what you can of him. But it was just interesting to see Joe Rogan kind of invite him on his platform. And I think it kind of does say a lot. It is kind of a credit to Joe Rogan's personality and maybe what maybe more of us should do in life anyway in general is that he's obviously a lot of us are quite dubious or he is quite dubious of this person's intent or what they're doing with their life but they're still quite open to hearing what they have to say and i think that's an important um, kind of strength on in or an aspect of your life to have quite often you can make an assumption about someone and just close the book on it and not want them to kind of like put their case forward not that, you know, they have to put their case forward in order to convince you that they're not a bad person. But there's also that point where you also have to accept that maybe if you have, if you receive more information, maybe you should be open to changing your mind. And that's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean you don't know what you're thinking. It doesn't mean you're a flip-flopper. It just means that you've got more information. And with that more information, you're able to make a more reasoned uh, opinion or whatever it may be. So it was great to see Joe Rogan invite him on his platform and kind of get him to kind of just, you know, just talk quite openly. And the good thing about Joe Rogan's platform or podcasts in general is that they're agenda neutral for the most part. Um, the host of the podcast is usually just happy to have uh, somebody on of some sort of interest that, you know, can talk about various subjects. And the person that's getting interviewed also knows that when they're coming into it, there's no set agendas. No one's going to come in trying to, like, tear you down or make you look stupid or put you on the spot or get you in a, a how moment or whatever. So it's great to see more kind of, like, celebrities and famous people kind of want to jump on the podcast wagon and use that as a platform in order to have their voice heard. For a long time, Twitter was that platform. You know, you could go out on twitter and twitter was kind of like a great platform because it was sort of like a mini blog it sort of still is a mini blog where you can kind of like put out short statements and kind of like rebuttals to anything that has been put out in the press or by the media but it was great just in general just to kind of for dan as well to be a bit more to be a bit vulnerable and put himself out on the line like that because i'm pretty sure he's quite familiar with joe rogan's podcast and the audience and how joe rogan is anyway as a person so for him to go on that show was you know I had a lot of respect, a lot of props for him. So, obviously, I listened throughout the whole thing. And a couple of things kind of struck me straight away from listening to the interview. Number one, a point that I kind of made on my blog, which you should check out, um, that's defaultgoon.wordpress.com. I need to sort out and get a custom URL for that. But if you just type in into into Google Default Goon blog, you can probably check it out. So, that's Default Goon blog.wordspress.com the interesting part of that I kind of got from the Dan Balzerian interview was that he strikes me as somebody as an point I made in the blog was that he strikes me as someone that has had to kind of like shield himself from public 
and he's kind of invented this narrative for his life that isn't quite true. So there was parts of his story that he was speaking about that kind of like, you know, they resonated and you can you could, you know, you got the sense that he was, you know, telling some sort of truth in it. But there was a lot of half troops as well. A lot of bits that he kind of like glazed over and didn't really get into much detail about and, you know, kind of um I don't know filled it up with fluff words and stuff and didn't really get down to nitty gritty and Joe Rogan pushed him on a few bits to kind of like give some dates and time but not in like an inquisitive way just in like a kind of like hey I'm just interested to find out when you did that when it, why it happened why you left or whatever whatever and what it kind of reminded me of was um you know that feeling when you go to like a or when you've been to a job interview and it's just not quite going right it's like, a, you know, you could feel it kind of like coming off the tracks. And generally, it's usually at that point where you feel that the other person doesn't quite believe what you're saying. And they're sort of like probing and sort of like trying to dig deep and trying to get you to answer specifics about a project or about what you've done or about why you're here or all those kind of questions, whatever. And then you start kind of fluffing it and you start trying to like, you know, fill up, fill up the space with words that don't really mean or say much. And I kind of got the impression that he was doing the same thing. And it's a shame, really, because for the most part, I don't think there's that many. Uh, I don't think he's lying about such a major thing. Maybe there's some lies in terms of his background, in terms of how he actually accumulated the wealth that he has. But for the most part, he's not lying. He does do what the fuck he wants. He does fly jets and I don't know helicopters and race dune buggies around and fuck like scantily clad women all day all night I'm pretty sure he does do that and get fucked up at, at the same time but there's bits about his background that you know he's had to kind of like um lie or kind of bend the truth around just so people kind of get off his back a little bit and it's weird as well because he's obviously someone that's come from an affluent background. He's obviously someone that hasn't had to like struggle most of his life in terms of making money or being in a position where he can make money. And it's strange that usually in society, when it comes to people that come from you know well-off backgrounds, we're usually, for some reason, we're quite hard on him in terms of the public, in terms of opinion. We tend to judge them a lot more harshly than we would do a blue collar person that had to like struggle from the ground up and it's strange because especially when you're faced with a person that's come from a rich background and they're trying to shun away from it you know they don't want to be associated with that past or that surname that they have they want to kind of make their own name and we seem to kind of like be even more harsher on them for some odd reason and you see it in varying facets across the kind of like celebrity spectrum and two examples that kind of jump to mind straight away is from the deceased Dashno R.I.P. who came from a very affluent um, aristocrat aristocrat family you know no one would kind of expect it and completely went the opposite way you know like became a graffiti artist spent his time in the lower east side getting fucked up you know like became a really influential contemporary artist and unfortunately died of a heroin overdose but he was completely completely against having anything to do with his family name and i think a lot of the stuff to do with his family only really came out um after his death obviously if you're knowledgeable and your your ear was to the ground and you were subscribed to those graffiti forums like i was like a 12 pound profits 12 pounds profits and stuff like that you'd know that you'd know those information but from, but from the outside from the art world no one really knew that so it's quite interesting to see how he kind of like interpreted or uh, his wealth and kind of shunned it and then the other example which is a weird one is sort of Jaden smith i kind of feel like he kind of gets a bit of a hard ride from the public with his uh, kind of like um pseudo intellectual sort of like rants that he kind of goes on um in videos and sometimes he's kind of cryptic tweets that he kind of puts out and whatever and his ideas about changing the world and doing better for humanity and stuff like that like he's quite you know he's quite he's quite entrepreneurial he's quite inspirational he's got a bit of the elon musk in him that's all well and good but for some reason a lot of people seem to poo poo him and try and try to say oh you're just a son of will smith you know like you can do whatever you want what the hell are you doing and it's strange because he's obviously not that an outlandish character you know for the most part pictures i've seen of him he just wears a really big hoodie and skinny jeans he's really kind of like low-key and whatever he's not really showy with his wealth he kind of tries to keep things mellow but for some reason he gets a real hard stick from the public and even his sister willow they kind of similar kind of like reactions and it's strange because especially in this area that we live in now 
with Instagram or whatever. And especially, I think the the first time I kind of discovered the rich kids of Instagram was a kind of like telling moment as well. Like for me personally, that was a great window in order to see how the other side lives. You know, there was this program that I remember I used to watch with my mum called Through the Keyhole, where they kind of went to these old mansions, old houses, and kind of like um, peeled back the history of the house, who lived there, where, um, who, what, what they did in there, why this piece of furniture was in there, why this piece of uh, decoration was there, blah, 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 blah. And it was a really good interest. It was a really interesting TV series to watch because it showed you how the other side lived. And when I mean the other side, I mean the upper middle class or the uh, upper class people or the kind of aristocrats that you had like no idea what that world was about especially coming from a a working class background that I did or that I'm still from so when I saw the rich kids of Instagram for me it was a great insight into like what these kids of like ultra wealthy ultra successful what the kids of ultra successful people do and what they're about because imagine you're a kid and you're 16 and you're just born into wealth you know your dad's like uh, insane I don't know metal or oil merchant somewhere and he's just like you're just on a level where you're just like insanely wealthy where you have a trust fund that kind of like will support you until the day that you die so you don't have to work a day in your life or wonder what that life is like and for me it's just always intriguing it's not nothing about it's not nothing really about jealousy or whatever it's just an intriguing world to be in to know that there's kids out there that just have never suffered a day in their life they've never lacked for anything not suffered because that's relative but they've never lacked for anything whatever they've wanted their hearts desire they could get and you think of programs like sweet 16 there was a lot of kids like that on that level too some of them didn't get whatever they wanted because that sometimes that was quite the the interesting bit of drama in that show was that somehow you know a girl would want a particular car and the dad wouldn't get it for them etc etc that made it quite interesting but for the most part rich kids of instagram especially the tumblr when i when i first sort of discovered the tumblr and I think they've I think they've released a book as well. I think they've got a book out. I remember seeing that somewhere. I'm not sure who published it or whatever, but you should check that out. It's probably gonna be on Amazon and stuff. But I remember seeing it and thinking, oh my god, that's amazing. Do you know what I mean? What what what, what an insight of seeing how, what these guys are doing, you know, like on private jets and driving around in Ferraris and taking pictures of insane watches that of names I can't pronounce, you know what I mean? It's just like a crazy world to live in, to kind of have a look into. And for the most part, Instagram and social media has done that anyway. You know, it's kind of like pull back the curtain. And a lot of these people that probably felt a bit uncomfortable about showing off their, the trappings of their lifestyle could because those platforms invite it. You know, Instagram is a sort of extension of what Flickr was. Flickr was all about uploading beautiful pictures and Instagram is about uploading beautiful mobile pictures. You know, like you want to have a beautiful stream. You want people to look at your account and see all these amazing pictures. You know, a, wing of a, a picture of a wing of an airplane, a picture of you with your seat up uh, next to a perfectly curated table of food like just you know your lifestyle is kind of like promote it's kind of extenuated on these platforms so if you're someone of wealth it's a good sort of like safe haven to go to because you're not really going to be judged because the whole premise of those kind of platforms is to show beautiful pictures but there still is a distinction there still is a different sort of level of intrigue or criticism when it comes to people of ultra ultra wealth or ultra successful and someone like Dan Bazarian is a good example of it you know, like you go down these mentions or you go down these comments or you read some of these comments on these pictures and you're like, there's a lot of hate on these pictures, a lot of like questioning of like whether or not he's legit and all this sort of stuff. And it's, it always seems to be quite interesting for me, like the amount of scrutiny that kind of gets dealt people that are in a more fortunate position than others than most people are, especially when they're not douches. I get it when they're like douches and they're forcing it down your throat. Like there was like, who's that kid that... um was like kind of giving up money for Instagram. Some Asian kid, I remember, I think I remember seeing him on World Star Hip Hop or something. Some kid that, that was like showing off his wealth and I don't know, eating McDonald's like inside a Ferrari and spitting it all out and shit. Like just being crazy with his with his wealth. People like that, okay, cool, I get it, you know, like you, you're gonna invite hate. But for the most part, if you're just a guy like Dan Balzerian in, in your early 30s, mid 30s, and just enjoying the trappings of a successful life or of accomplishments that you've made earlier on in terms of his poker or maybe from his from his dad's money and stuff it's no harm to anyone really so it's strange that some people would have that kind of reaction and i'm and i think i remember from what brian callen said on the fight companion he made a lot of assumptions about 
um, Dan Bazarian's self worth or the kind of like value that he has in humanity and what he's doing for the world and whether or not that kind of lifestyle is uh, something that people should be aiming for and it doesn't have any merit and doesn't have any weight or anything. And I was, I don't know, I was a little bit miffed by it because for me personally, I, I, I don't know, I try to keep my opinions uh, split between, you know, the everyday man and the intellect. For the most part, the intellect is not, I mean, I don't profess to be some sort of academic or whatever, but I try and keep my opinion split between, you know, being well informed and also just being a regular guy on the street that just forms his opinion on what he sees and nothing more. And sometimes it, 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 want, it kind of like intrigues me when people make that assumption that people don't believe or that it's not true that some form of wealth, some sort of prosperity, some sort of a personal advancement isn't going to make people happy. And I'm pretty sure the regular guy on the street, as I mentioned in my blog, would be insanely happy if you just offered them 30 grand a year, you know, without having to work. If you said to somebody, we're going to, I'm going to give you regular payments of 30 grand a year spread across 12 months and you don't have to lift a finger. That would, that would improve a wide, 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 wide portion of people's lives. I guarantee you. Like it would make them insanely happy. Yes. There's still the caveat that us human beings have this fallacy where for some reason we always want more than we have. Cool. But for the most part, people would be happy with just 30 grand a year. Split across 12 months. Regular payments. That's like, what, two grand a month or something. They'd be mu- they'd be soup. They'll be over the moon. So to say wealth can't bring happiness is ridiculous because that, that to some people, relative as it seems, is wealth. That would, that would open up options. That would allow someone to take maybe an extra holiday a year. Allow them maybe to buy a few more things a month. That are, I don't know, like you got have the possibility to eat out a few more times. Those are all things that people kind of see as like marks of wealth. Obviously, there's, there's a pop, part of the population that wants to win a gazillion dollars or gazillion pounds in the lottery and stuff. Cool. Or be the next Facebook. Fine. But for the most part, people just want to have the kind of finer things in life and be able to have disposable income so they could do the things that they enjoy and when they see someone like a Dan Bozerian just doing whatever the fuck they want I'm pretty sure not everyone thinks that they can also go and fuck 10 models a night and drive doom buggies through Dubai but they just want a portion of that lifestyle and usually it's, it's more about the aspect of being able to do what you kind of want and the precise word there is kind of you know so cool, I can't go to Dubai to race a dune buggy, but I might be able to go to a Lanzarote. I might be able to go to Morocco. I might be able to go to Egypt. You know, like there's different, there's like levels that you can kind of work at that might not be the same level as kind of Dan Bozerian, but you can do it. And that's what those kind of guys represent. So for some, for the guy, average guy walking along on the street, when he sees Dan, he does see a successful person. He does see someone that's fulfilled. And then the other question that kind of pops into my head is that why is it an assumption that if you're someone of wealth or if you're someone of high standing that you should be some sort of humanitarian? Why is it that if you have wealth that for some reason having wealth and enjoying the luxuries of your wealth is somehow deemed as being an empty life? Who said that? I'm not sure that's true. And not everyone's mission in life or not everyone's calling in life is to be uh, a humanitarian of any kind. And I'd much, I'd probably argue the fact that I'd much rather people be honest about what they can contribute to the world as opposed to trying to get on a soapbox, as opposed to trying to do some sort of action and it just turning out, turning out or turning off to be a little bit weird, a little bit misread. A good example was... Um, Asap Rocky trying to speak about race relations on the Breakfast Club. He like, maybe he's doing more for race relations by being himself and by making amazing music and bringing all these different people, all these different cultures and races from all around the world under one roof to celebrate his music with, and then maybe using his lyrics as a way to kind of like spread a message. Maybe he's doing more with his talent, with his creative output than he will ever do by sitting down with the breakfast club and trying to speak about what contribution he's made to black culture or to the you know to the fight 
against police brutality and stuff like i remember that and if you haven't checked it out if you haven't checked it out i guess you should check it out but it's quite cringy it's super uncomfortable i get that he was probably ace rocky was probably ace rocky was probably put in a position where you had to say something but i don't know man like i'd much rather my celebrities just be honest and say look i can't do nothing this this isn't my this isn't my lane but what i can do with my creative um leanings is do xyz and even if you can't do that just dude you man like not everyone has to do that thing not everyone has to be that guy and for some reason and like brian, has, brian callen probably isn't the only one that's saying this about adam balzerian i'm pretty sure a lot of people do some people uh, i don't know ascribe or subscribe to the fact that if you're in that position you should be doing more for the world but who says you should and why should you wealth doesn't mean social responsibility wealth is just a way for you it's a function more of your family name isn't it it's more of a it's more of an extension of you you're wealthy so the people around you are wealthy doesn't mean the world is going to be wealthy it just means your immediate family whether it's your own family or your friends that's all it is there might be some people that have are more commendable and go out and use their platform or use their wealth in order to kind of like uh, help humanity but I don't think that's everyone's responsibility and it shouldn't be forced down on people either because then you end up in weird positions where people are doing like I said crazy shit like I remember seeing or just the other day I saw this picture of uh, Jerry Lorenzo handing out free kicks of free shoes to free kicks and clothes to um homeless people in LA and it was a and I don't know really there was really well taken pictures of him handing out pieces of clothing and his team and a nice video roundup it just I don't know man it just didn't sit right you know why are you making a video of you giving poor people clothes why don't you just give them the clothes and again maybe there's an aspect of him that feels that he has a social responsibility in order to give back and show people he is giving back but do you does he need to do that shouldn't he just do that in silence without the cameras does he need to do it is it really something that's in his heart or is that something that he wants to do as an image or to show something who knows who knows where the intentions are but it's just more so along the fact of i think as a society we need to be a little bit more forgiving for people that are in um more advantageous positions because as amazing as it looks on the outside the pressure and the responsibility the perceived responsibility that's put uh, that is put upon your shoulders can sometimes be a lot to bear that's why some people can act out and do crazy stuff and you're like oh why does he why is he doing all this weird shit why is he or she doing weird shit when they've got a gazillion dollars in the bank it's because of this weird societal thing that pressure that people are putting on them in order to be a, a be something they're not you know we're kind of like projecting our own thoughts and opinions on this person and wanting them to be that character show that avatar when they're not when they don't want to be anything of that you know it's like the happy-go-lucky TV actor that is a complete introvert and doesn't want nothing to do with the public, rejecting someone's uh, autograph. It's like, dude, that's the character he plays, you know what I mean? That it's another person in real life. And it's weird how critical we are, people with mild success or varying levels of success. And you've got that impression, listen to Dan, where he's been conditioned over time to kind of like build up this persona of whoever he is now. I'm not sure if that's him or whoever. He's built this persona up of himself and and with that he's kind of like inserted like a couple of lies, a couple of truths, a couple of lies, a couple of truths along the way. And it's a shame really because by the end of the interview you realise that he's quite a cool guy, you know? Like standard standard guy. Like standard guy that has money and has a little bit of brain and isn't a complete douche, you know? Like he does what he does, he enjoys himself. And he was quite introspective towards the end, you know, wondering what is it what's gonna happen next, you know? He's 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 in the rare he's got the rare life experience of being able to do whatever the fuck he wanted. So now he's wondering what I'm else am I gonna do? You know? Imagine being in that position. Think about that for a minute. Imagine having everything you've wanted in life by the age of thirty five. What do you do then? So sometimes as amazing as it can be to look at people in these sort of bullshit positions and wonder why you're not there, sometimes the beauty and the enjoyment of life is the toil, is the struggle, you know, is the uh, millionth time you've went out and handed out a CV and no one's got back to you, is the time you've asked out that guy or girl and your hands are with sweating and the person said no, 
is the time where you put all your hopes and dreams into a plan for an event that you wanted to do and it falls flat and no one turns up you know these sort of like moments in your life where things just fuck up and don't work out you know I don't know you lose your phone in a foreign country and you don't know where how you're gonna get back home like I don't know just weird shit man that you just you know real life shit that happens is sometimes the best part of life you know because getting over it or exploring that issue is what kind of makes life worthwhile and if you're in a position where you're able to kind of like correct every single wrong that you have or that you kind of encounter along the way or you're able to put your inoculate yourself from any sort of like you know catastrophe of an, an event you know like you you don't really miss a bill um you, you don't really need a job so you're not really job hunting or job looking you're not having to prove yourself to people um people flock around you so you don't have to look for friends you don't f- find it hard to make friends either because people uh, naturally want to be around you because you're a star imagine that life you know like imagine having everything you want and then being at the age of 35 and then wondering fuck what am I going to do next? Especially if you're someone that's, um, if you have some sort of like aspirational mind, you know, you're you're not just like living life day by day and, and happy just to wake up the next day. Especially if you think there's something in you that makes you think that you might be able to do more, which maybe that's what Dan has. There's something in him that's a bit like, Ugh, is this all? When you start to question life and start to wonder, like, why am I here? Imagine that. I think it's all well and good if you're just like a a kid that's like, you know, you're rich and you don't care. You don't really want to go to school. You just want to like live off your parents' money. I think that's all good too, you know, like you just want to just do you and just exist. Then you won't run into this issue because you just keep, you just keep on keeping on, you know, you just keep on doing what you're doing. You probably get together with someone of the similar sort of wealth. You make a family and it will just continue. But imagine being the other kid, you know, the kid that, that does have the wealth, but you want more. And not more material things. You want more out of life. That might be. That must be an absolute mind fuck. So sometimes, you know, don't be so hard on these guys, man. Like maybe the life that you're in now, as hard as it is, as confusing as it is, is a blessing because you're able to. I don't know. Climb that ladder every single day. You know, you're not at the top of the ladder. You're just, just starting. You're at the bottom. Not even the middle. And every step that you take is super, 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 super gratifying, you know? You get a better job than the last one that you got. Amazing. You make another friend. uh, You make a better friend that you did last year. Amazing. Uh, You lose a bit of weight. Amazing. You can finally fit into those jeans you bought four years ago. Amazing. Like, it's just tiny little things that you do. It's just like, oh, so cool. You move to a new flat somewhere in an area that you didn't think you'd ever, ever, ever be able to afford great you go on another holiday amazing and imagine not having that imagine just having everything and hitting a brick paying a bit of a brick wall that must be a mind fuck man so i think i to taking away from it i just got the sense that he's had to lie so many times over the years just to kind of protect himself from the judgment of others that he's a basically a rich kid and he's created something out of himself, you know. Maybe he is a rich kid, but in the same sense, in the same sense that people that poo-poo Donald Trump because he got one million dollar loan from his dad, you know, like not everyone, not every kid that gets a one million dollar loan from their dad is able to become a Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Like some of them just get that meal and spend that in a week. He should, like, I'm, I'm, trust me, it's not a common thing for a Dan who is a rich kid to go on and become this. Uh, behemoth of a social media figure you know i'm pretty sure he's got brands chucking themselves at him considering his reach so i think he's achieved a fair bit considering his background you know he could have rested his laurels and just picked up the checks but he didn't he tried to do something more and this it was a good interview it was good to get that kind of insight but it was also quite saddening that you're watching a grown man having to kind of like invent an avatar for himself in order for people not to judge him as if uh, he's a rich kid, which he naturally is, you know? Just embrace your shit, man. But I think the takeaway from that is just to be a little bit less harsh on celebrities or people of wealth and kind of, like, put your, you know... Put your feet in their shoes. Try and be them for a day or for a year or for a lifetime. Probably isn't as amazing as you think.